into that a little bit, please? Yeah, so uh, wars are fought first through supply chains, right? And uh, during peacetime, the United States military has certain requirements to maintain a peacetime arsenal and peacetime level production. So peacetime production and peacetime supply uh, reserve. I, I found this fascinating. This whole, I'm starting to become a fan of the Sean Ryan podcast. Now, I've only watched a few of them, and it's really more about the guests. I, I got a feeling Sean Ryan and I would necessarily agree on a lot of things, and he might be a piece of shit, but he might not. Jury's still out on that for me, but I, I don't think we line up a lot of things. But I will say that I do enjoy his podcast so far, just with the simple way that he that he interviews and how he, the questions that he asks and then he lets his guests expand. Uh, I like the way it's shot and all that too. So, uh, uh, so far I'm enjoying his work. Are much less than wartime, right? And it's because the idea is if some kind of conflict were to break out, then all of the existing supply would be used to support the conflict while we spun up production to start producing more weapons. Well, what happened here is that the conflict wasn't with the United States. The conflict was with, an, with not even an American ally, but a country that we chose to support at a certain time. So all of, our, all of our reserves of weapons, which were all dated, they all had a shelf life, right? It's kind of like when you fill your, your pantry with canned tuna fish and canned beans. You know, the, as soon as a snowstorm hits, you use that first because you want to use it up, right? You don't want it to expire. So we sent them all of these dated weapons. That was the first round of weapons that we sent. Well then, as the conflict continued, we started seeing it as an opportunity for us to test some of our more modern weapons. So we sent HIMARS. We're start, now we're sending... Uh, sending um... I talked about this. I talked about the fact that this really is this whole uh, support that we're doing in Ukraine is it altruistic? It's to support the military industrial complex and to keep the weapons manufacturers uh, with orders. One hundred percent. I've talked about this on my podcast before. I know. I know. I'm not the first person to think about it or talk about it, but this is what I truly believe. Different types of satellites and and uh, radio equipment, right? We're, we started sending more experimental stuff, drones, to Ukraine. But we never started resupplying our stocks because we kept producing at peacetime levels, even though Ukraine is spending ammunition at wartime levels. Right. So that was part of right. the reason the United States started telling Germany and France and Poland they had to start sending weapons to Ukraine was because our peacetime reserves were used up and our peacetime production levels can't maintain the fight. Right. Uh -huh. So we're in this jam, and in this jam, we have to decide as a country, do we start producing at wartime levels, even though yes. we're not at war? They will. One of the they big will. reasons that you see bipartisan support for the conflict in Ukraine is because both Republicans and Democrats know that their constituencies are going to benefit when the American military industrial machine starts producing at wartime levels. Fuck producing me. more ammunition, more cannons, more hand, more small arms, more protect. Because the United States is basically a munitions factory. That's what this government is. That's what this republic is. It is a fucking munitions factory first. Here, we're going to make a huge stockpile to support us if we ever go to war with China. But we're also going to create this huge stockpile that we can then keep using to supply Ukraine and drive up GDP, drive up American benefits. You don't have to believe me. This guy's a fucking Fed. He's a fucking CXCIA. He's a fucking Fed, and he's just saying it out loud. He's just saying it out loud. Right? The same thing is happening in Russia. And this is where, again, if you're going to be honest, you got you to gotta call honesty for what it is. Russia is fighting Ukraine with Russia's old weapons. That's why the tanks that they use and the guns that they use and the ammunition that they use failed them. We sent our surplus and our stockpile to support Ukraine. Russia used their surplus and their stockpile to launch an invasion. That's why it didn't work. Now, all of Russia's best stuff, Russia's a little bit like us. They create weapons. They invent weapons. They also manufacture weapons. 
but the main source of their income is in exporting those weapons. So for the last 25 to 30 years, Russia's been exporting their cutting edge weapons and their dated weapons, they've been exporting them to places like China. So when you hear headlines now talking about China giving lethal aid to Russia, what that really actually means is China reselling their Russian ammunition back to Russia. That's not the same thing. If Russia sold their excessive weapons to China, and now China is selling them back to Russia so Russia could use them in the Ukraine because Russia cannot build weapons fast enough to resupply for their war. This is all about using munitions for both countries and having to fucking restock them. America has given advanced weapons to Ukraine essentially on a, on a lease basis, right? We have given Ukraine better weapons than they previously had, and we're giving them our weapons. The lethal aid that people are trying, that the newspapers and the, and the White House are trying to say is so, uh, is a red line of some sort. The lethal aid that China is trying to support Russia is actually just giving them back the same weapons that Russia sold to China in the last 20 years. Right. 20 year old shells, 15 right. year old cannons, right. Right? right? They're just giving, they're just selling them back the same munitions that they bought from them before. Right. That's bull market. That's capitalism. Yep. It's threatened nuclear missiles. So do, are you totally discounting that? I don't totally discount the use of nuclear weapons. Here's, I will say that the probability of a nuclear weapon going off in the United States is extremely small. Mm -hmm the probability of a nuclear weapon going off in a NATO country is extremely small. It doesn't make any sense for Putin to use a nuclear warhead in a country that guarantees war with the United States, that guarantees retaliation with the United States. That doesn't make sense. Fair enough. But it's not nearly so cut and dry, right? People think, again, thanks to the oversimplification of media, we think that Russia's gonna launch some nuclear weapon that hits New York. That's not how wars are fought. Wars are fought with covert action and with plausible deniability. So what happens if a small yield nuclear weapon goes off in Kiev? There you go. That was smuggled there in a briefcase through Belarus. That's a much more likely outcome. Who takes responsibility for that? Who does NATO hold accountable for that? Yeah. Right? The only facts, the only evidence you would have are a blast in Kiev, no missile, yeah. no source that you know of where it was deployed from, and maybe you can track it back to crossing the border from Belarus, but Belarus isn't at war with Ukraine. Belarus is a proxy for Russia, but you can't hold Putin responsible for what Belarus does. You have to hold Lashenko responsible for what Belarus does. But who holds him responsible? It's not a NATO country. So does NATO go to war with Belarus? You see how messy that would get? Mm -hmm. That's how this kind of conflict actually happens. You want there to be so much confusion that people can't plan their response. One of the benefits that autocracies have over democracies, China, Russia being autocracies, Syria, uh, Syria Iran being autocracies, is they don't have to worry about bureaucratic gridlock. The United States on its own has bureaucratic gridlock all the time. Yeah. NATO, NATO is a conglomerate of bureaucracies. 100%. It's a bureaucracy of bureaucracies. 100%. So imagine the gridlock that yeah. they have to deal with. Yeah. Part of the reason the United States is the, is the one funding Ukraine is because NATO can't make a decision. It, they can't make a decision over six months, let alone six hours, yeah. right? At least the president can pass an executive order and everybody moves forward. So autocracies are constantly playing against that democratic weakness of bureaucracy. So a, a pocket nuke goes off in Kiev or a pocket nu nuke goes off in, in the Donbass region and it's smuggled through Romania or it's smuggled through Moldova or it's smuggled through 
uh, Belarus, who's, who's held responsible for that? What's the global response to that? NATO is gridlocked. The United States is putting pressure on NATO to come to a certain conclusion, but NATO doesn't want to come to that conclusion because then they look like they're being bullied by the United States. Right. In the meantime, you still have a nuke that just went off in right. Ukraine. That is absolutely within the realm of plausibility. But what's the benefit? Unless it's a city like Kiev, unless it takes out the entire presidential core or the entire leadership core, it doesn't really benefit Russia. And that's what Russia, if Russia's gonna use a nuke, if they're gonna use a nuke overtly or covertly, they wanna use it in a way that brings a very specific benefit to them. For anybody who's thinking, oh, this is a conspiracy, bringing a nuke in a briefcase, I'd like to remind you that Andy was on the nuclear program for the US Air Force, so uh, I think he's a pretty credible source. <laughs> but um, 